Thank you, sir. Next, we have a talk by Dr. Tom Devasya, interventional cardiologist from KMC Manipal. He will be speaking on reperfusion after myocardial infarction. We have Dr. Tom Devasya. Good evening, and uh, regards to all of you from KMC Manipal. I thank Dr. Prabhaga for giving me this opportunity to spend some time with you. Uh, we'll discuss about reperfusion in MI. As we all know, a total occlusion of the culprit artery leads to an ST elevation MI and a subtotal occlusion with thrombus occluding, causing subocclusive or partial occlusion of the lumen produces a non-ST elevation MI. Once an MI is diagnosed, we try to reperfuse the ischemic myocardium either by means of a thrombolysis or by a PCI. So once this is done, we have to assess our reperfusion, whether it was successful or not. So how do we do this? During PCI, it's relatively easy because we do have an angiographic blushing and we can have a TIMI scoring system and based on the TIMI 3 flow, we say a successful reperfusion. But then, sometimes we thrombolize and then we have to assess how successful we were. How do we do that? Most importantly, the symptoms. The patient's symptom, by whatever reperfusion strategy we follow, should come down by at least 50%. Most often it's angina and the angina severity on a scale of 0 to 10 should come down by at least 50%. Then, we should have evidence to prove that what the patient tells us is correct and for future documentation. So we take a repeat ECG. Simple test. We have ST resolution. I'll come to that once again. T wave changes and QRS abnormalities. To assess this, let's try to recap the evolutionary changes that happens in an ECG during an MI. First, there is the hyperacute T wave or the giant positive T waves, which reflects acute ischemia. Then the ST segment goes up, which produces the injury. Then there is Q wave, slow development of T wave inversions, and the R wave height may come down. Then the ST settles, the T wave inversion becomes more deep, the Q wave becomes really prominent. Sometimes when a large amount of myocardium is infarcted, you have QS wave and then T inversion which may persist for some more time. Then the T inversion may become normalized with only QS wave remaining there. And sometimes if the perfusion is not good or that the territory is fully infarcted, the negative remodeling may cause a persistent ST elevation which can lead on to LV aneurysm. As far as the time is concerned, from zero over, which is the time of onset of the pain or the MI, at four hours, the ST shift, six hours, ST and Q, 12 to 24 hours, ST settles down, T inverts, Q is there, nine to six hours, ST is nearly normal, two weeks, Q is there, T is inverted, and six weeks, again, T is inverted and becomes flattened. My medicine postgraduate told me the mnemonic nasty loser, QT, to show the ECG evolution of MI. The N stands for the normal ECG, then the ST elevation is there, then the, there is loss of R wave, and then there is Q waves and T wave inversions. ST resolution, how do we assess it? Basically, we want 50% ST resolution. So we can go by a single lead criteria with the maximum ST elevation what was there when the patient was first identified with the height of chest pain. Or you can have a sum of ST elevation with a total ST score identification and see whether the total ST score has come down by 50%. Also, the reciprocal changes that had come due to ST depression, they also should resolve which is the reference points we compare it with. It is usually the first ECG, that is the maximum ST elevation ECG, but we can compare with either of those. The SN2 trial was there, comparing 13,100 patients. ST resolution at 24 to 36 hours relative to the enrollment was done, 
the amount of ST elevation was measured at 20 milliseconds after the J point with the use of a handheld caliper. The sum of the ST elevation was measured from lead 1 AVL V1 to V6 for anterior MI and 2, 3 AVF V5 and V6 for inferior MI. Jack 1994, they also recommended that early T wave inversion within 24 hours after thrombolytic therapy or PCI predicts a better coronary perfusion, almost a TME3 flow, and it correlated well with clinical and angiographic study. Garboza in American Heart Journal 2000 said that negative T waves shortly after an ST elevation MI is a good marker for improved survival rate. That means the uh, time from an acute ST elevation to the weeks after T inversion without the formation of Q and ST um, drift is bypassed and we achieve a very good myocardial flow early on. Other importance of early T wave inversions, most of the times there is a higher incidence of TME 3 flow what we are all striving for once we try to reperfuse. There is a better ejection fraction, lesser myocardial damage and a lower incidence of positive late potentials which probably leads to reduced incidence of post MIVT, a higher risk of reinfarction or recurrent ischemia. And enzyme wise as we all know there would be abrupt CPK rise within 12 hours instead of the usual 12 to 24 hours peak. This is just a sample ECG. We know that uh, any medicine postgraduates, what am I is it? Yes, there is ST elevation in V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, 1 and AVL. Acute extensive anterior volume MI, yes. So once it is diagnosed, you try to reperfuse and after reperfusion, this is a ECG. We can see that the ST has settled, ST score, total ST score has come down and the T wave has inverted. We assume this patient to be symptom free and have a good reperfusion with probable TME3 flow on angiogram. So that's the assessment. Just a small note on reperfusion arrhythmias. Once reperfused, during the first 24 hours, patient, patients are prone for reperfusion arrhythmias. The common ones are sinus bradycardia and sinus tachycardia, but very often we do not worry about them too much. Sometimes there is this accelerated idioventricular rhythm and may lead to confusion. Let's try to see the CCG. Medicine postgraduates, what's your diagnosis? AIVR. Can you tell me one or two findings that can suggest the origin as ventricular on ECG? QRS duration more than 120 milliseconds, then? Northwest axis, AVR is positive, then? Absent P waves, okay. That can happen in AVF also. Anything else? Ventricular origin of the QRS. RSR pattern, yes. It is an RBB morphology of ventricular uh, rhythm. Anything else? V5, V6 has a QS morphology, which is suggestive of a ventricular origin. So we know that this is a ventricular origin rhythm and no P waves are there. So this is a typical AIVR we see after revascularization. Kindly note that the presence of an AIVR does not necessarily mean that the patient is fully revascularized. But once we revascularize a patient in cath lab and see the patient developing AIVR, then we put the diagnosis as yes, it's an AIVR reperfusion related. But sometimes even totally occluded arteries also can have AIVR and doesn't necessarily mean reperfusion. Now questions, is it stable rhythm? Any, anybody can answer, medicine PGs. Yes, why? Because this one, the rate is between 60 to 100. VTA becomes extremely unstable when the rate is very high. 
so it's a stable rhythm is it good yes it is good provided this is a true reperfusion arrhythmia and not just another arrhythmia related to the mi what is the mechanism medicine pgs medicine pgs are there finally yes can you raise your hand okay the mechanism is automaticity why is it called aivr it's accelerated because the ventricular rhythm is usually around 40 per minute whereas this one will have a rate of around 80 to 100 and it's accelerated so it's accelerated idioventricular rhythm where is the focus sir was telling before it has rvb morphology so it's from lv there is the reciprocal rule of bundle branch block pattern that we know so if it is from the lv it will have rbb morphology it's from rv it will have lbb morphology whereas if it is from the septum it can have either lbb or rbb morphology how does it start does it start with an escape beat or an ectopic beat any guesses yes aivr starts with an escape beat whereas a vt starts with an ectopic beat and is it more common in inferior posterior mi or an anterior wall mi yes very often uh, there are quite a few others who believe that it is more common with infra posterior mi but it's almost as equal with an infra posterior or an anterior wall mi patients with prolonged aivr of course we know it's a stable rhythm if the patient has a few seconds of aivr we are not bothered do not give antiarrhythmics do not cardiovert as long as the patient is hemodynamically stable which most commonly they are but then if the patient is in prolonged AIVR, couple of hours, what do we do? It's not good to have ventricular focus for quite a long time because sometimes it can lead to myocardial suppression and loss of AV synchrony. So we try to achieve the AV synchrony and activate the sinus node most commonly with two ampules of atropine and then a flash. Very often the sinus node will be activated, the sinus, road, sinus node rate will pick up and the heart rate will go up above 80 which is most commonly faster than this AIVR and the normal uh, sequence of events is restored so atropin is the treatment thank you thank you sir I request Dr. Yogesh assistant professor Fathambula Medical College to present a certificate of appreciation to Dr. Tom Devas